You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host and bourbon soak storyteller, Juliet Miranda. Hi there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda, and welcome to episode 134 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Studio a lifestyle brand that makes premium headphones with studio-quality sound and classic Scandinavian design. These headphones are the perfect combination of style and tech. Just go to studio.com, that's S-U-D-I-O dot com, and check out their entire range of products. If you find something you like, just use the code RANT during checkout, and you'll get 15% off your purchase. So I am back this week with two bourbon soak stories for y'all about our attic animals, and a drag racing disturbance. But first, we need bourbon. And now that it is finally feeling like spring outside, I'm breaking out one of my favorite seasonal cocktails, Buffalo Trace Bourbon Whiskey. Cheers, y'all. Ugh, this tastes like spring. Buffalo Trace Bourbon is just light and smooth. It really doesn't need ice or water. It has a corn, rye, and malted barley mash bill. But here's what I love about the flavor. And maybe this is just me, but there's a subtle sort of grassiness to it. And it's balanced by sweet vanilla and caramel and spicy cinnamon. Y'all, this Buffalo Trace, it just tastes like a sunny day. And I am so happy to report that it is so nice outside. We're actually going to the drive-in tonight for a horror movie double feature. Although that could be a little problematic because I think it's safe to say I've seen a few too many horror movies. And some people, and by some you know I mean my guy, well, he would argue that seeing this much gore and mayhem over time has desensitized me to violence. He may be right, but that doesn't really concern me. What concerns me is how horror movies have changed the way that I react to everyday things. Like, here's how my ridiculous brain works. If our fire detector starts blaring at 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't think that it's a fire. No. Me, I think it's a poltergeist. I don't even believe in poltergeist, but that's where my brain goes. And if the bed starts shaking, it's not an Illinois earthquake, which, believe me, we do get. It's a goddamn demon. So you can only imagine the crazy places my brain went when I heard scratching inside our ceiling not too long ago. Because I knew deep in the pit of my soul that this was something bad. Like chupacabra bad. I have to admit, Illinois is not exactly known for being overrun with chupacabras. Our local paranormal celebrity is Resurrection Mary, and she spends most of her time hitchhiking outside of a forest preserve. But you gotta understand, these sounds were seriously messed up. I would be in bed, laying there, just about to fall asleep, when I would hear vigorous rustling over my head. Now, at first, it was just kind of tentative and random, but over the course of a week, those noises became increasingly more organized. Scurrying upgraded to thumping, and scratching just became outright digging. And it was so aggressive that I would open my eyes and be prepared to see several wild beasts blinking down at me from a gnawed-out hole in the ceiling. But here was my problem. I was the only one who was hearing this racket. You see, my guy goes to bed much, much later than I do. So by the time he came upstairs, my little attic rave would be over. He would sleep in quiet, peaceful slumber, And then he'd laugh at me in the morning when I would be a twitchy mess and suggest that our attic had become a hostel for vermin. I tried getting him to stay with me in the room while I fell asleep, but my guy looked at me as though I had lost my mind. And for a minute, I considered if maybe I had. Because in situations like this, it's only natural to question your perception. And I do have to accept the fact that... (laughs) I am not an entirely reliable witness. Hard as it may be to believe, but sometimes I'm a little prone to exaggeration. So maybe my guy was right. 
maybe all of these crazy noises were just a part of a ridiculously vivid dream. I tried. I tried to go to bed like a normal person and fall asleep. And I would think of happy things like balloons and rainbows and fluffy little otters floating down a river. I would try my best to suppress the memory that this was exactly how the exorcist started. So I'd bury my face in my pillow and I'd just, I'd reassure myself and I would say, there's nothing here. And even if there is, what could it possibly do? And it's here where my brain takes a hard left right into Terror Town because I can think of a whole lot of shit my attic creatures can do. And right on cue, my brain conjures up an image of some sort of winged goat sucker crouched over my bed, and that's when I hear it. Although it isn't exactly accurate because I heard them. Not one, not two, but many sets of clawed feet were parading over my head, clacking and thumping, and I swear to God they were dragging something with them toward the end of the room. And then there's more clamor and more scuttling, and out of nowhere comes a long, piercing screech that I swear to God I felt all the way to my toes. I mean, have you ever had the sensation that something is just plain fucked up, where you are completely devoid of rational explanations, and you're only left with your own rigid fear? Well, fuck fear. I grab the baseball bat that I keep under the bed for nights when my guy is out of town. I hurl myself upright onto the bed. And I take that bat and I start drumming on the ceiling. I am yelling, I don't know what you fuckers are, but I want you out of my house. And I'm banging, I'm swinging that bat. And that is how my guy found me. Half naked and standing on the bed, wielding a bat like some sort of berserk majorette. So my guy starts creeping toward me. And he's saying, what you doing, baby? He's obviously trying to sweet talk that bat away from me, but I am not having it. I shush him and I say, they're up there. Now, I'm sure my guy has anticipated the day will come when my crazy finally breaks bad, but he probably didn't think it would come so soon. So he's not listening to me when I keep insisting that something Many somethings are up there over our heads and quite possibly turning our attic into a saw style playground. So I say, Will you just shush for one minute and listen? Well, my guy does. And he's rolling his eyes the whole time and probably wishing that he'd had the foresight to put the local loony bin on speed dial. When praise be the flying spaghetti monster, because there is an army worth of scampering over his head. I'm so relieved, I forget my fear and I start to laugh, but my guy, (laughs) my guy does this freaky little hop and he backs out of the room, huddles in the doorway and he says, what the fuck was that? Oh, I don't know, my love, only the same damn sound I've been living with for the past week and a half, thank you very much. There's more banging then, inexplicable rolling, and then there is nothing. My guy peeks into my closet to make sure that the metal attic hatch is secure, something that I did a week ago, and then he announces we need to call animal control. You think? There's no, gee, baby, I should have believed you. No apologies for nearly signing my commitment papers. Just the understanding that I am apparently always going to be considered crazy until proven otherwise. The next day, two guys show up on our doorstep. One is from Animal Control, and the other is from the maintenance staff of our townhome complex. I don't really know what I expected from the Animal Control guy. I suppose ideally I had hoped that he would be someone reminiscent of the crocodile hunter. Or at the very least, like one of the guys on Swamp People. But Zack, that was his name. Zack. He looks more like a Disney prince, but with his... Floppy hair and pearly complexion and swarthy stare. I mean, I wanted a killer, not a charmer. As for the maintenance guy, Barry, well, he had the look of a hostess Twinkie and the brains to match. While Zack is questioning us about all the sounds that we'd heard, 
you know, his hair blowing majestically in the breeze. Barry is struggling to replace the batteries in his flashlight. He puts them in one way, then another, and knocks that light on his hand a couple of times before he finally realizes he needs to turn the damn thing on. This was our dynamic duo. These are the ones who are going to rescue us from the horrors of our attic. I was more inclined to burn the whole house down. I mean, it seemed a far more efficient method. And it had the added bonus of taking out the scary black spiders that hang out in our baseboards. So I make the suggestion that we do just that. And it was mostly in jest, but I got that simmer down crazy look from my guy. So fine. I'll let the so-called experts handle things. We all head into my bedroom closet where we confront the metal hatch leading to the attic. Now, in all of our 10 years at this house, my guy and I have never actually been up there. So we're kind of curious to see what's in there. Barry positions a ladder under the hatch, and there's a little bit of a standoff between him and Zach because neither one of them wants to be the first to go up. Ultimately, Barry wins, or perhaps loses, depending on your vantage. So he gets to be the one to slowly climb up that ladder and undo the hatch. He clearly does not want to be doing this. But he braces himself and he opens the hatch and shines his flashlight into the space. And we're all crowded around the base of the ladder, with Zach hot on his heels. But we all quickly back away when the smell hits us. It's ripe, and it's putrid, and very, very fresh. Kind of like it had just been hovering around the hatch, waiting for the right moment to assault our noses. And Barry fumbles on the ladder because he is just stunned by this noxious haze surrounding us. But he's got Zach right on his ass, you know, Zach, our chicken shit Lancelot, who is pinching his nose and hiding behind Barry's bulk. But he forces him upwards. My guy and I are still looking up cautiously, and it occurs to me that if there is an animal up there, that thing could very easily dart out of the hatch and land straight on our faces. Well, the only thing that drops out of that attic is Barry, who skids down the ladder looking very pale and kind of barfy. It turns out there are no living animals up there, just two massacred squirrels in the throes of decomposition. They had clearly been feasted on. Well, my guy retches a little bit, and poor Barry is forced to trudge off for a plastic bag and a shovel. But then there is Zack, bounding down the ladder in all of his glory, and he announces that he has found the gateway our predators have been using. It's this small, chewed-out hole along the edge of the roof. But not to worry, he declares, because Barry can patch that hole and he'll leave a trap to catch anything that might be hiding between the walls. Zack rummages around in his truck and returns with one of those no-kill traps, which he baits with peanuts and then deposits in our attic. Barry, meanwhile, has scraped up the squirrel remains and is now stuffing that hole with newspaper and some tarry-looking goo. He says it's a temporary fix until he can get a professional out to us, and he's mostly sure it'll hold. That's not quite the vote of confidence that I was looking for. And again, I'm struck with the urge to solve this problem myself in, let's just say, some more outlaw fashion. Because I don't see how these two puttering numbskulls are going to rid us of what I am confident is not a cute Disney-style raccoon. I mean, these guys, they didn't hear the noises coming from up there. They didn't hear the gleeful shrieks as whatever prehistoric beast that is, is gleefully disemboweling our resident squirrels. That night, the attic is quiet. Weirdly quiet. And the next day, Zack returns to retrieve an empty trap. He proudly proclaims that our problem is solved, and he rides off into the sunset. Me? I'm not so convinced. Because that cage Zack pulled from the attic was decidedly empty of an animal, and of the peanuts he had put there the night before. Were Zack a conscientious kind of guy, I could rationalize that by assuming he had cleaned the peanuts out before bringing the cage down. Or, more likely, he could have spilled them in my closet. 
But then there's also the chance that those peanuts were taken. And once again, I had a horror movie moment. Recalling that scene from Poltergeist where Tangina makes a rather overconfident statement. And y'all, I know. Damn it, I know. Our house is most definitely not clean. Time for me to break out the baseball bat. Just a friendly reminder, y'all, that if you want to improve your listening experience to this podcast, to other podcasts, for music, TV, whatever you listen to, you can make it that much better when you check out Studio Headphones. They look great, they fit great, and they sound incredible. Go to studio.com, S-U-D-I-O dot com, and check out everything they have available. They have on-ear headphones, in-ears, And they even have wireless in-ears now that aren't just pink, but blue and red as well. And remember, 15% off at checkout when you use the code RANT. So I went to see my parents last weekend. They're planning on moving to South Carolina in the next year or so. So my mother has been on this crazy purging spree. My family have really never been people to save stuff. But she did have a box of my old nonsense that she wanted me to go through before she tossed it all away. And initially, it really didn't seem like all that exciting stuff. Mostly, it was a bunch of concert t-shirts that I really should have burned a long time ago. But then I found one thing that stood out. A rotor arm. I had to laugh when I saw it. Because it is just like me to save something as weird and random as that. It's one of the very few car parts I know anything about. And not surprisingly, I didn't exactly come into that knowledge in the most honorable of ways. I mean, to say that I was something of a terror as a teenager in the 1980s is a dramatic understatement. And it's here where I feel the need to make the requisite disclaimer. Because by today's standards, my youth could really be considered grossly inappropriate. And what I'm going to tell you now is truly appalling. It is. I get it. Because by the time I had hit 15, I had fashioned myself after the girl depicted in the Motley Crue song, All in the Name of Rock and Roll. I don't know if you've heard this song, but it is a delightful gem of sleaze rock. And it has lyrics like, she's only 15, she's the reason I can't sleep, and I want to be your nasty anytime you want. You know you can have me. That song was my theme song. I realize that's gross. But to be fair to myself, I can say that this disturbing hormone-fueled power trip that I was on was just a phase. And a short-lived one of that. But that didn't make me any less dangerous. I couldn't go anywhere without oozing lust. Really, no place was safe. Not school, not the mall and definitely not the drag strip. Every spring and summer, my dad would pause his work in his physics lab and head into the garage to soup up a hot rod for drag strip racing. And oh my God, y'all, it drove my mother insane. I mean, if my dad wasn't burning holes in the ceiling with his plasma arcs, then he was killing the shrubs along the driveway with exhaust fumes. I never really took much of an interest in his drag racing, until it occurred to me that the drag strip would be a good place to meet guys. And then I was all in. I convinced my dad to take me to a Memorial Day drag race, and likely against all of his better judgment, he agreed. The pit, which I suppose is something like a backstage area for drivers to prep and show off their cars, it was seething, seething with enough long-haired testosterone to just make my head spin. I didn't even know where to start. So while my dad was off tinkering with his car, I decided to go on the prowl. Cars are lined up in rows. Some had accompanying trailers and tents, and it kind of made the pit seem more like a giant tailgate party. One that I had no business being at, because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was gritty and loud and Most of the guys there were so busy with their cars, they didn't have time to pay attention to silly little me, strutting up and down the aisles looking for attention. 
I actually started to wish I'd paid a little bit more attention to my dad's tedious descriptions of his own car. At least then I would have had something to talk about. As it was, I judged a car kind of the same way I did a guitar, only by who was operating it. But my excitement was really starting to wilt a little bit. It was dirty, it was sunny, and my hair was falling. And I was tempted to turn around and go back to my dad, but then I heard a familiar sound. Motley Crue. The song Wild Side was blaring from a tent at the far end of the lane. And as I approached it, my hormones just started rising. The obligatory hot rod was displayed in front, of course, but sitting in two chairs next to it, were the most attractive guys my little teenage eyes had ever seen. Of course, in hindsight, I realize now that they were clearly fishing for a girl like me. Someone nubile and completely devoid of common sense. God, I was an idiot. (laughs) And I'm disgusted now by my behavior. I am because it was just so awful. But I undulate up to these guys. And I lean against their car and I I strike my best pinup impression, and I'm thinking I'm so cute and so awesome. And not surprisingly, my brazen display did exactly what I had hoped. Because within minutes, I was getting to know my two hot rod heroes. I'm sure they had names, not that I really cared, which was fine because they didn't much care about my own name or my age. It really was the perfect balance of deliberate ignorance. So as we're talking, one guy reaches down into a cooler by his feet, and he asks me if I want a drink. But he doesn't wait for an answer. He just pours some Coke into a cup, and then tops it off with another liquid from a bottle that I can't see. And then he hands me the drink. Ugh, oof, I hate saying this, I really do, I hate it. It's so just awful to think about. I'm in this situation, and I've got this drink in my hand, and the guys are watching me as I consider it. I'm feeling excited and terrified. Because in the moment, I just, I inherently understand that I've entered into one of those after-school special situations. And wrong or not, that really made me feel important. Like, look what I just made happen. Now, believe me, I know. I know that this is not a good situation. And as I'm standing there with the drink in my hand, I understand that there are two options. There's a good one and a bad one. So I picked. I lifted the cup right up to my lips, and I knocked that drink back with conceited glee. Oh, God, I can't believe I did that. But here's the thing. The drink was kind of sweet from the Coke. But more than that... It was full of fire and smoke, and I had never tasted anything like it. And God help me, I loved it. (laughs) I, I am ashamed to admit it, but I did. I loved that drink. Because to that point, I had had plenty of beer, which I've never enjoyed. I'd also had champagne, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but this drink was different. Right or wrong, it was good. I was immediately lightheaded and giddy, and I asked the two guys two questions. One, can I have another? And two, what's in it? That illicit cocktail contained my very first taste of whiskey. Jack Daniels, to be specific. And I quickly got another cup. And this time they'd made it even heavier on the booze. They likely would have fixed me a third cup if I hadn't remembered just then that I needed to be at the grandstands to watch my dad's race. Well, I innocently invite my two new friends to watch the race with me, not realizing that I had just completely cock-blocked myself with a single word. Dad. Oh, I never saw two guys go from flirting to fleeing as fast as they did. They had their backs to me and are rooting around under the hood of their car like I never even existed in the first place. Which leaves me feeling dumbfounded, dejected, and kind of drunk. Because neither of them had the good sense to take the cocktail away from me. I stagger away and polish off the rest of my drink while watching my dad tear up that strip. That was back when he had his charger. 
a car that to this day he often speaks of with more fondness than he does me, his firstborn daughter. Not that I entirely blame him. So I meet him back at the designated area in the pit. And although I am not hammered, it doesn't take my dad long to figure out that I've been drinking. He quizzes me on where I got the booze and mutters something about me being the reason he went gray before turning 40. But then he asks me to lead him to where those two guys are stationed in the pit. And that sobers me up real quick. I beg my dad to not make a scene. I am making every empty promise I can think of. You know, I'll never drink again. I'll never talk to strangers. Just please, please don't do anything to those two guys. Because although my dad appeared perfectly calm, the fact was, just a few weeks earlier, I'd heard him use that same rational voice, tell a boy I was going to the movies with that he would treat him the same way he did his bearskin rug if that guy brought me home late. So I didn't know exactly what he was capable of doing to these two predators. I trail after him and I reluctantly point out their lair. And we show up just in time to see those guys walk off with two rather buxom blondes. And for a minute, my stupid teenage feelings were hurt. I was such a moron. (laughs) But my dad is still kind of raging on dad anger. So he tells me to stay put. And he walks up to their car, which still has the hood wide open. He leans over and reaches in. And this certainly wasn't an uncommon thing to see there in the pit, but I am in a complete guilty panic because what if he gets caught? You know, what if those guys come back and then my dad gets arrested? And this would all be my stupid fault. I can't see what he's doing, but it doesn't take very long. So my dad strides away and he's looking very satisfied and he motions for me to follow him back to our own car. And there is where he hands me that rotor arm. And he says kind of smugly, they're not going anywhere without this. Well, I'm quiet because I don't really know what to do with this information. So my dad sits down next to me and he says, listen to the old man for a minute. You know, just saying that now, it makes me smile because that's always what my dad would say when he was about to make a point. Listen to the old man. He nods toward that small rotor arm and he says, here's the thing. Me taking this, that's nothing. It's nothing compared to what those two guys could have taken from you. That was all he had to say, because I knew exactly what he meant. And he was right, and I was completely ashamed of myself, because for all of my stupid hormonal urges, I knew better than to do what I did. So I expected my dad to ground me then, because God knows I'd earned it. But he didn't. Instead, my dad made me carry that rotor arm around with me for the entire summer. Well, of course... I have to admit that that rotor arm isn't the only thing I took away from the experience. Clearly, the whiskey made something of an impression. And I admit that may seem like a dichotomy. But really, I think a lot of our lessons that we learn in youth are. Still, this is why I rarely go into the full story when people ask me how I came to enjoy whiskey. In the end, I discredit my dad for giving me a small but potent reminder to make good decisions. Cheers, y'all. Well, I think that's enough out of me, y'all. Thanks so much for listening to the Unwritable Rant podcast. Now, before I let you go, I want to let you know that we're going to be giving away another pair of studio headphones. Just go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up for my emails. And then keep watch on Twitter. I'm at Morning Neurosis. We'll be making the announcement very soon. In the meantime, y'all, I'm going to go find myself some more bourbon, maybe a little bit of trouble, but I will be back to tell you more bourbon soak stories next Sunday. Cheers, y'all. Go to theunwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make a way up to Bourbon, a couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. It is all the same, what you say, Bonton. 
And it pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this 